God is good all the time. God is good. Man, what a comfort when you know that you belong to the Lord. That's challenging. I am yours. Are we? How much of us belongs to the Lord? Anyway, that's fouling me up right there. Hey, look at your neighbor. Give your neighbor a high five. Say, I'm glad you're here today. Whatever we're doing, it's always better when we got somebody to do it with. Makes our joy double and cuts our troubles in half. Hey, we're glad you're here this morning with us. Bethel Assembly, if you haven't been here, you haven't been in a while, we may not be the best church in town. We might be. <laughs> yeah, we are. But I know this, you know, we love the Lord. We may be common people, we may be common here, but I hope that we love the Lord and we know that we need His help. Amen? So if you have your Bible this morning, turn to uh, Luke chapter 24. Just going to read one scripture we read a few weeks ago when we opened. Verse 49. Just to get us going this morning. Luke 24, verse 49. says this, it's Jesus speaking. And behold, I am sending you forth the promise of my Father upon you. But you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Pray with me. Father, we love you. We thank you for loving us, God. Uh, Lord, as we talk about your promise, there's so many promises you have, Father, but I just pray, Lord, that you would anoint this word today, that you would meet us where we are, that you would speak to us where we can understand, that you would challenge us, but yet you would encourage us in the potential we have in you, Father. I just ask that you would touch lives and meet needs, have your way in this service, in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. So uh, we started the series a, a few weeks ago just talking about the promise of the Father based on... Uh, this scripture when Jesus says, listen, I'm going to ask my father and he's going to send this, his promise to you. And so that's kind of the basis of this, this, this series. And as we get into it, we just begin to identify uh, what this promise is. I mean, there's many promises of God, but this specific promise that Jesus says, this is the promise of my father. This is his DNA. And we just begin to identify that it's the Holy Spirit. It's his DNA with us that we need for us to have the fullness of God. We've talked about, uh, just not to repeat everything we've said, but if you haven't been here, that God is a trinity. And we need the fullness of God. We need God the Father, we need God the Son, and we need God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the part of God that you and I have with us. He dwells among us. And so He is the, the gift for us. And if we want to live the fullness of God, look, if you don't want to live the fullness of God, if you don't want to mess with it, you don't want to walk in the plans of God, then... Maybe this isn't for you. But I just believe in my life, as he's challenged me, that it's not to be a believer, and it's not to go to church, and it's not just to be better than you used to be, but it's to be everything that he's created us to be, which goes back all the way to Genesis and Genesis chapter 1. And this may be too far out there for some, but when he told Adam and Eve, he said, be blessed and multiply and go and subdue the earth. That's what he's commissioned us to do. We go and subdue the earth by establishing his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven by just walking as a child of God. It's not some kind of weird, far out there thing. It's just us being everything God's created us to be, walking in his plans, and he does the rest. But to walk in his plans and for us to be all we're called to be, we got to have help. Amen? We need his help. We need his Holy Spirit and it's the spirit that he told was going to be prophesied, is going to be poured out in Joel 2.28 in the last days, being after Jesus had done his work on earth. His presence, his spirit is going to be poured out on all men. So last week we talked a little bit about the benefits and they go on and on and on. He gives us life and peace. He helps us. He gives us divine power. He lets us see. He opens up our eyes. He, he, he teaches us how to love the way he loves other people. And he, sometimes ourselves. he convicts us. He, he, he renews us. He transforms us. He changes us. There's so many things. He guides us. He counsels us. The Holy Spirit, so many benefits. It goes on and on. And I've asked you, uh, if you would, and I'm asking you again, if you've forgotten, but to be in prayer with me, 
to be in prayer for what God wants to do. We always want the Spirit of God to come in our midst and touch us. We, we believe He does. But we're just praying into next week that God would show up, that He would meet us exactly where we are, that He would fill us up. Uh, and like he never has before, or he would fill us up like we haven't been. Just when we are consumed in his presence, not to make it weird or uncomfortable, but just the reality that we need the fullness of God in our life and us confessing it and admitting it. I'm asking you to pray with me, to fast. Some of you say, well, that's fasting. What does that mean? I can't wait for a week. Well, maybe, but not necessarily. It just means that I'm setting myself apart. I'm saying, God, uh, maybe for you it's not food. Maybe it's a Dr. Pepper. Maybe it's coffee. Maybe it's a, whatever you do. It's just acknowledging and saying, God, I'm setting myself apart, and I'm asking you to come and, 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 and answer what we're asking you to do. And I want you to know this. It's not just us doing it, but many of you know this, that we have Bethel here, but we also have Bethel and Anson, and we have Bethel and Sweetwater. And I just want you to know that we're all on, this, on the same page. And if they're all our messages are a little bit different, but what we're trying to do is all of us praying here and in Anson and in Albany for God to do the same thing. And I'm just thinking, how cool would it be that if in every place on all these three locations that we begin asking God to meet us and fill us in a way that maybe we never have been before. And next Sunday, we all come praying and believing that God is going to meet us here and we leave here changed. We leave here renewed. We leave here full of a passion for life. And we get to be a part of that. And so anyway, you didn't need to know all that, but you did need to know all of that. Where was I going with all that? <laughs> Here's the thing. I don't know about you, but sometimes I need more than just some words. Sometimes I need more than, than just what somebody else is telling me. But I need to see an example. I need some, some solid examples. And when I think about an example, example, an example is a pattern or a model that, that of something that can be imitated. Or maybe if it's a bad example, then maybe it's something to, to be avoided. But neither the case, here's the thing. Success leaves clues. Do you know that? Success leaves clues. Sometimes we wonder, well, how did they get to be what they're doing? How did they get to be so good? Success leaves clues in every area of life. Uh, we, we think about athletics. You know, I think about basketball, and I think about Michael Jordan. We, you know, there's clues. If we go back and we, we see, sure, he was gifted, sure, those things, but there's clues about his work ethic and uh, about the way he went about stuff in modern day, and because it's fresh on everybody's mind, and this is a little bit hard for me to even say, but we look at Tom Brady because uh, love him or hate him, him. You know what? This dude has been successful. And the thing about Tom Brady is not only is he successful, but he makes everyone around him better than they were. He makes them successful. And so we can either downplay and, and be haters or we can take notice. What makes this guy successful? What is the example? There's clues out there. We can look at business people, people that are successful in business. If we get to know them, we can learn what they've done. It leaves clues. Lead Leadership. There's clues. People that are great leaders in life, great leaders in society, they're leaving clues. They set examples if we will pay attention. So today we're going to look at a few examples of people who were touched by and empowered by the Holy Spirit. The first one is Samson. Anybody know who Samson is? If we looked at Samson and you want to look there, you can, you can look at Judges. Judges chapter 13 through 16, it, it, it kind of lays out uh, Samson's life and what he had done. But it, we find out about Samson that he's basically born of an unknown, unnamed woman. Doesn't even give his mom's, give his mom's name. But this woman who was barren, the Lord sees her, and the Lord goes to her, the angel of the Lord, and says, hey, you're going to conceive, you're going to have this child, you're going to name him Samson. And he, she gives, he gives the, the mom instructions about how to raise, raise this child, about how he's going to be consecrated for my purposes, for the purposes of the Lord. And he says, he's going to be like a Nazarite to me. He's going to be completely committed to me, that he's going to take a Nazarite vow, and he's not going to cut his hair, and he's not going to partake of alcohol. And he's not going to eat anything unclean, anything that could defile him or come between me and him because he belongs to me. And so she gets instructions about how to raise him. And then it goes on and, and it talks about all these mighty acts that Samson performed during his life. 
just in Judges chapter 14, it tells a, there's several examples, but it tells a story about he's on the trip, this trip to see this young woman who had caught his eye. And on the way to see her, this lion jumps out in front of him and roars at Samson. So what did Samson do? It says that Samson took the lion with his bare hands and he killed the lion as if it was a young goat. Then a few verses later in Judges chapter 14, it says that the Philistines, they had been manipulating and they had been messing with Samson's wife trying to get to, to win a bet that they had with Samson. Well, it infuriated Sa Samson so much that he goes down with his bare hands and it says that he kills 30 of them and then he takes their spoils, which the bet was, and he gives it to someone else. And so then it goes on in Judges 15 and it talks about how when uh, well, Samson's own people, because you see, he was, he was, the, they were the Israelites. Samson was an, he was a Jew. And, and, and they had offended the Philistines. They were worried because they were in bondage to the Philistines. And so his own people, they take him and they tie him with cords. And they say, we can't have this. They're going to they're gonna, they're destroy us. And so Samson, they take Samson. They're going to deliver him to the Philistines. Well, as they get to the Philistines and Samson hears their voice, it says that he breaks the cords and he cuts loose and he takes this jawbone of a donkey and he strikes down 1,000 of the Philistine men in that day. These are mighty acts. And so we just begin to question, how could a guy do such things? How could he do these things? Well, you know what? The Philistines ask the same thing. In Judges chapter 16, in verse 4, it says this, After this, they came, it came about that he loved a woman in the valley of of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. The Lord of the Philistines came to her and they said to her, entice him and see where his strength lies. In other words, we don't know how he is able to do the things that he does. Would you help us find out? Because we need to know how he does these things that he does. You know what? I think this. I think many people have this certain picture of Samson. When we hear the stories and we hear the acts that he's done, we have this picture in our mind. Or maybe we see kids' books. Or maybe we've seen something on TV. Or we've seen a picture of this man named Samson. And we think of Samson as this big, Herculean, bulked-up dude. Kind of looks like me. I mean, he's cut. And he's ripped. And he's got it going on. But I would declare to you... That I don't think he looked like that. I think more he looked like what I really looked like. He looked frail and he looked weak. Maybe somebody like used to be like a Pee Wee Herman. You know, and everything he did was just a little bit awkward. You know what I mean? Why do I say that? Because if he was some big hulked up Herculean dude, they would have known where he got his strength. But he wasn't that way, and that's why they couldn't figure out where does his strength come from. So let's take a look and see if there's any clues. We're looking back in Judges 14. These are all things that I mentioned a while ago. Verse 5 and 6, it says, Then Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother, and he came as far as the vineyards of Timnah. And behold, a lion came roaring towards him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, so that he tore him as one tears a young goat, though he had nothing in his hands, barehanded, but he did not tell his father and mother what he had done. Nothing in his hands, but it says the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. You know what? Sometimes there's lions in this world, and there's things that try to attack us, and we're always wanting to hide, and we're always wanting to run, and we're always thinking we're not prepared. And sometimes we need to just be like Samson and ask the Spirit of the Lord to come upon us and let us become a lion chaser, and let us become like Benaiah that we went back a few months ago and talk about how he just ripped this lion apart because this lion is trying to keep me from the plans that I have. But anyway. A little bit later in that chapter, again, when, 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 when they had tried to manipulate his wife in Judges 14, verse 19, it says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, and he went down to Ashkelon, and he killed 30 men, and he took their spoil, and he gave it the changes of clothes to those who had told the riddle. In other words, the ones that he had made the bet with. The Spirit of the Lord again came upon him mightily. In Judges 15, 
It says when he came to the Philistines, when they had him tied up, when they had arrested him and they were taking him to deliver him to the Philistines, it says the Philistines shouted as they met him. And again, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily so that the ropes were on his arms were as flax that has been burned with fire and the bonds just dropped from his hands and he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey and he reached out and he took it and he killed a thousand men one man with a jawbone of a donkey no sword no weapon no cannon no laser no nuclear anything a jawbone of a donkey and he strikes down a thousand men that were coming against him where did his strength come from? Was it was his own strength? Obviously, you know the answer. His strength came from the power of the Spirit of God that was on his life. The second example is Peter. Peter. Oh, bullheaded Peter. A great leader. Great apostle. We hear about some of the things that he did, but when we look at the overall picture and we think about Peter, he was nothing but a fisherman. He was a fisherman that was down there tolling, that smelt like fish, that was on the boat all day and all night, and he worked and he did what he did, but he became a disciple. He was one that Jesus called, and he says, hey, Peter, Cephas, come with me. I've got plans for your life. And it says that Peter goes with him, and he followed him for three years. He was close to Jesus. He became friends. He was like in his inner group, in his inner three. He was up on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus was glorified in the presence of the Lord with Moses and Elijah. Peter witnessed it. His, he saw blind eyes open. He was a part of feeding 5,000 with a couple fish and a few loaves of bread. He had seen demons cast out. He had seen Lazarus raised from the dead. He even walked on water. He believed in Jesus. He loved Jesus. He identified him as the Messiah. And he committed that he would never leave Jesus. But let me ask you this. What happened to Peter when Jesus needed him the most? When Jesus was arrested, when Jesus was betrayed, what did Peter do? How did he respond? Luke 22, verse 54. It says, Having arrested him, they led him away, and they brought him to the house of the high priest. But Peter was following afar off. Peter was afar. Peter was a distance. He was a long ways away. He didn't want anybody to know that he was with Jesus. It tells the rest of the story in Mark 14, verse 66. It says, As Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came, and seeing Peter warming himself by the fire, she looked at him and he said, Hey, you also were with Jesus of Nazareth. But Peter denied it. Peter denied it. I neither know him or understand what you're talking about. And he went out onto the porch, but the servant girl saw him and began once more to say to the bystanders, this is one of them. But again, it says Peter denied him. That Peter denied that he even knew. He said, I don't even know what you're talking about. I don't even know this guy. It even goes on in that passage to say that, that Peter even cursed. That he cussed, he said, man, forget it. I don't know what the you're talking about. I don't know this Jesus. I don't know what you're talking about. And it says that immediately a rooster crowed for the second time. And Peter remembered what Jesus had said and said, before the rooster crows twice that you will deny me three times. And at that moment, Peter began to weep because Peter knew that in all his pride and all his cockiness and everything that he had going on in this moment, he had failed. In this moment, he had let Jesus down. He had followed afar off. He had denied that he even knew Christ. How many times have you and I in church when they're singing and I'm feeling it and the words the way I want it and I'm all about Jesus and I'm shaking hands and I'm smiling and I'm telling everybody how good I'm doing. But how many times do we go out there in the world where Jesus is really asking us to be Jesus and stand up for him and tell the world that I belong to Jesus and we're hiding and we're denying and we're ashamed and we're following afar off because I don't want anybody knowing that I'm hanging out down there at that church. But the reality is this, we got to see a little bit further. Even though he failed, even though he failed, he never quit. 
Sometimes this is the greatest lesson we can learn is just don't quit. When you get down in the first quarter, you can check it in or you can keep playing. And too many times in life, we go through a bad quarter and they're pressing us and they're getting up on us and we check out. And sometimes we need to be like Peter and we need to just keep going. Peter never quit. But there's something that happened to Peter. There's a change. There's a shift. Because we see the same Peter who had just denied Jesus, who had just said, I don't know him, who had just cussed, who had just said all this stuff. We see him in Acts 2.14 a few days later. And it says, but Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, men of Judea, all of you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. And he began to share the message of Jesus. He began to share to them what Jesus had done and by what authority they were walking in. And then in verse 41 of Acts 2, it goes on and says this. So then those who had received his word were baptized. And that day, this is a church service, man, I can't wait to be a part of, that 3,000 of them were saved and gave their lives to the Lord. I'm talking about the same Peter that had just denied Jesus that a few days later preaches so powerfully and stands so boldly and so convincingly that 3,000 people walked the aisles, that 3,000 people said, I don't care about my background. I don't care how I failed. I don't care if I was part of putting him on the cross. I got to get to this Jesus, man. What was the difference? We see him just a, a little bit later in Acts chapter 3, the story about the, blame, the, 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 the lame beggar that was healed. He had been there lame since he was born, man, and he was begging. And here comes Peter and John on the way to church because they got to get to church. Ain't nothing going to keep me from worshiping my Jesus. And they go into church, and as they walk through the gate, beautiful, here's this lame beggar, and he begins to cry out to them and say, hey, give me something. Give me some money. Give me some alms. And Peter looked directly at him and said silver and gold have I not but what I have in the name of Jesus Christ get up and walk and he reached down this man who was weak in his faith and he helped him to his feet and the man all of a sudden got strengthened and began running through the house of God praising and glorifying his name the same Peter that had just denied it goes on and says I don't even know where I am at in Acts chapter 4, verse 4, just accumulation of what's happened in a short period of time. But as many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. I'm talking about revival. You want revival? Peter's in the middle of this revival. In a matter of days, 5,000 men have given their lives to the Lord. Man, I declare if the Spirit of God would move on this place and move in this town, how many would you get excited about if 5,000 men in sweet water texas and nolan county and fisher and all these connected counties would come to the lord in a real way <laughs> but here's the deal wow it's awesome it's exciting but what is the difference what changed where where was the shift at what happened what changed this guy i can read you the story in acts chapter one we read it a couple weeks ago. But when they entered the city gate and they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter, John, James, Andrew, and all the rest, they were all in one mind, seeking the Father, continually devoting themselves to prayer with all the women, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. And it goes on in Acts chapter 2 when it says, when the day had fully come of Pentecost, and, and they were up in this place seeking, and the heavens were open, and it came a mighty rushing wind, and all of a sudden came in this place something as tongues on fire, and it seemed that if it was on every one of them in that place, and they began to speak, and they began to prophesy even in other languages, and it says that they were all filled they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, with the presence of God. I just want you to see that even though Peter had the right intentions and in his heart he wanted to do good, that in his own strength he could not do it the same way you can't do it, the same way I can't do it. But when the Spirit of God got on him in fullness, man, and he surrendered to what God wanted, it changed him into somebody that could do anything that God had asked him. It changed him forever. The last example is me. You say, well, I can believe 
I, that's good. That's a good story about Samson and Peter, but I wasn't there, and I don't know how relevant that is. Well, let me tell you about me. I grew up here over here in Roby on a hog farm. <laughs> Smelt good. Common. And this is my, kind of my deal. I grew up a great family, learned right from wrong, went to church, believed in Jesus. I had a sense, I can remember as a young boy growing up in junior high, coming into high school, and I had this sense that God had something, that God was something, but I, I didn't understand it. And as I began to grow up in the world, I, I wasn't strong enough. I wasn't strong enough to resist the world, to resist the temptation, to resist the pride, to resist the girls, to resist the alcohol, to resist all. Can we be real? To resist it. Good people fail. Because they think they can handle everything on their own. And I come to this place where I'm 20 years old, 21 years old, and I'm troubled and I'm confused. And like, this isn't really working out for me. Many of you have heard my story in 1993 when I'm in this car wreck and my best friend's killed. And only by the grace of God, 10 days later, did I wake up out of a coma. I should have went too. And so I threw that situation and through a series of events and I can't deal with it and so uh, with really no other option it's either uh, kill yourself or surrender and through brokenness I surrender to God I surrender to God I give him my life it was a real encounter it was everything but after that I'm start trying to do it right I want to I want to make up for what I've done wrong. I wanna, I want I wanna, I'm gonna overcome this because that's what we're supposed to do. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna live, and I'm gonna tell people, and I'm gonna share, and I'm gonna do better. And that's good, and that's good intentions, but I struggled with always doing good. Anybody with me? And so then, because I had surrendered and it was real, and I had committed, so then every time I would mess up. I would feel condemned because I'm like, I really surrendered and I really told God, but now I'm failing and now I'm dealing with some of the same issues and the same struggles that I had before. And so now I'm condemned and I, I'm struggling with this. And I can remember, like many of you would understand this, but reading the word of God, everybody says, get in the word of God. And so I can remember getting in the word and reading the word. And I can remember, man, this really makes me feel better. It really makes me feel good about myself. But in the reality was, I really couldn't understand it. I really couldn't grasp what he was saying to me. And then I can remember going through this point in time where this, this one thing kept jumping out at me. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. I can remember some of my friends who were believers. I can remember asking some people at church, what is the Holy Spirit? What is the Holy Spirit? You said, by the Holy Spirit, what do I do? How do I get it? How do I receive it? What is it? I really couldn't get any answers. So I began seeking I begin questioning the Father. I discover what he talks about this gift. I discover scriptures that I've read you, that I've shared with you in John 14 and John 16. It's better I go away. I send you the Father in, John, in Acts 1. Wait on the gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit. So I start seeking. And it makes me think about Matthew 7, 7 when the Lord says, seek and you will find. In other places in scripture when the Lord says, I will be found by those who seek me. You see, the reality is when we start seeking God and we start really wanting the things of God, that he will reveal himself to us, that he will guide us. There's a lot of points where God done a lot of things in my life and in, in, in all of our lives. But just to condense this, I can remember one weekend, a walk to Emmaus. God had cleansed me. God had done a work in me. God had come alive in me. But I can remember this this instance on this walk to Emmaus one night, and there was an opportunity uh, to pray. There was an opportunity to come to the altars. Let me tell you something. For this little shy boy that, 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 that didn't make himself vulnerable or, or really like people, this was, because you always, you know, I grew up hearing about people going, really never went to church where people went to the altars, but I heard about it, and that meant you was weird, and you were really jacked up, okay? And I can remember that night, and I remember sitting there, and, and, and it was just a pr time of prayer. And I can remember, man, it was like the Lord was burning a hole in me, man. And I could just feel like something was just pulling on me. And, man, I'm telling you, I got up. I didn't know what I was doing. I felt like Peter walking on water. It was kind of dark in that thing, man. I was just walking down through there. 
And I went up to the altar, and I just... I just began to pray, man. I didn't even know. I didn't even know what I was asking for. I just began to say, God, and I thought, God, I don't even know, man. I just love you. You're just so real, man. I just, I sent you, God, and I don't know what you want for my life, and I don't know how to do it, God, but I just, here I am, God. I just want you to speak to me. I just want you to fill me up. I just want what you want. That's all I want. I just want what you want. And I'd been there, I don't know how many minutes, you know, and it was just like it didn't matter. Just there. And I can remember this man. It was a man I didn't know very long, but he was a gift from God. His name was Ben Van Zant. He was a colored man. And I just, man, I always thought of him as my soul brother. But he came up to me that night, and he just came behind me, and I didn't know who he was. I, I mean, I didn't know who was there. I didn't know, and he just laid his hands on me. And it wasn't anything silly. It wasn't anything goofy. It wasn't anything like that. And he just began to pray. And he just began to thank God for me. And he just began to ask God to reveal his plans for my life. And to show me the way. It was just a simple prayer. And for me to be filled with his Holy Spirit. And for God to illuminate himself in my life. And I don't know how to explain it to you, but some things change. No, everything changed. Everything changed. And there was many other moments, but this was just a specific moment that I'll never forget. And from that moment, my eyes were open. My eyes were open, and all of a sudden, I could see things that I had never seen before. I had never seen a sunset rise or a sunset the way I saw it. I never looked at somebody across the room and had a burden for them. And felt pain for something that I saw in their eyes. I never had a passion for life the way I, I did. And I want to tell you, it's been a long journey. And I want to tell you that I have been far from perfect. But I want to tell you that it changed me from this young man who was ashamed. Who at one point didn't want to live anymore. Who had been shy all of his life who certainly never said anything to any of his friends about Jesus. And he put this fire inside of me. And he started opening doors for me to do things that I never would have even attempted before. And I would like to tell you that it was because I did it myself. But the reality is that I had nothing to do with it. That it was only by the Spirit of God. It changed me. It wasn't by just a decision. And it wasn't just by my mind. But it was an inviting. And it was when the Spirit of God overwhelmed me and became bigger than I was. So you see three examples. Of spirit empowered life. I just want you to know this that I have nothing, there's nothing good in me except God. Some people sometimes I don't I don't want to talk about me, but I just want to make it really, really clear that this what what's happened at Bethel. How God brought us over here. How he, he, he started this thing. How we started with 27, 28 people at the first meeting. And that was because we invited them to come. They didn't even know why they were coming. And then allowing us to bring people. And, and putting it on people's heart. To, to, to bring us here. And allow us here. Those at First Christian Church. Mr. Bennett. Mr. Kearney. And so many others that, that said, hey, I think God wants to do something here. God's doing something. And I'm just saying that everything that the Lord has done through this point, whether you realize it or not, has been by the Spirit of God. And the reality is that the only way God is going to continue to do things is by his spirit. And we all need his spirit to continue walking in what he wants done. So here's three examples. I'm done. What is the Lord saying to you? The last thing I want you to see is this in these three examples. Samson, his spirit-empowered life was a direct result of a deep dedication and devotion to the things of God. 
And it started as a child telling you parents. Not that we expect perfection out of our kids, but we put them in an atmosphere and we put things before them that says you are separated and consecrated for the work of God in your life. There came a point in Samson's life where he sure had to choose for himself to do those things. But if we have young kids, we have that right and that calling to set that atmosphere for our kids. Peter's spirit-empowered life, and, and, and mine as well, was a story of brokenness and repentance. And I just want to make this point that these two qualities, devotion and dedication with brokenness and repentance, and when we add the infilling of the Holy Spirit, it equals power. Power to face whatever you're dealing with. Power to, to, to make it through school. Power to make the relationship work. Power to make the move that you're making in, in your life. Power to, to deal with. Power to be bold. Power to be a witness. Power to live a life that glorifies God out there in the world who desperately needs to see the real Jesus. So music team, you guys come. And I'm just going to ask you to seek the Lord this morning. What's the Lord saying to you? What's he saying to you? Are you lacking? Are you less than what you think you should be? Do you feel like you've lost it? Are you ashamed? Do you feel like you've made too many mistakes? No. No. Nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And when we receive that, we can understand that he's got new life for us. That we could be born again to open up. Maybe you're saying here, I just don't understand. I just can't see it. Can I tell you that J Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3, 3. Truly you cannot see the things of the kingdom of God unless you're born again. Born of the spirit. In other words, when the spirit comes alive in us. It changes us. This may be far-fetched for some of us, but this is the reality. And this is the Word of God. We have been trained by the world. We've tried to do it ourselves. It's time to quit that way, and it's time for us to surrender, like we talked about, to God and asking Him to empower us and Him to strengthen us. So let's just pray. Father, I love you. I thank you for this day. I thank you for each man, woman, and child here, Lord, because your word says that you're no respecter of a person, that you did it for Samson, and you did it for Peter, and you've done it in me, that you want to do it for all of us. And so no matter where we're at in our journey, if we're just beginning or we've been doing this for a long time, sometimes the reality is we try to do it in our own strength. God, just let us be reminded, like Zechariah the prophet said, not by might nor by power, but only by my spirit, says the Lord. Father, we need your DNA. We need your breath in us. We need your strength, your power, so that we can love, so that we can forgive, so that we can raise our kids, so that we can go to work, so that we can deal with issues in a parking lot in a way that's going to bring you glory. So, Father, I pray that we would, in a sense, become like those 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 early disciples men and women who went up into an upper room and we just begin to seek you they didn't know what they were seeking they didn't know what it was going to look like they just knew that jesus says you need to wait on this you need to seek this gift that the father's going to send and they just all of one but accord just begin to seek you father i pray that we would be a people that wouldn't be too ashamed or deny you but yet we would come seeking you father we would come seeking the things you want to bestow upon your people so that we could reflect you more correctly. If you need prayer for relationships or for health or for situations like that, we certainly want to pray with you. But other than that, I would just encourage you to come today seeking the Lord. Meet us here, Lord. And meet us here next week. In a powerful way for those that don't know you for those that feel like they're forgotten for those that feel like they're lost for those that feel like it's too late god that you would meet us in a powerful way lord we love you have your way as we close in jesus name so i just want to encourage you to to respond what's the lord saying to you don't let the devil steal anything the Lord's calling you to do.